Welcome to Math TV with Professor V. This video is a comprehensive review for Calculus 2, and it'll have to be done in multiple parts. So here's part one. Now I'm going to begin with area between curves and volumes because that's the first topic that we cover at the campus that I teach. But I know a lot of schools start with integration techniques and this topic I'm about to go over is in calculus one. So if that's the case for you, then just skip ahead till you get to all the integrals. They're coming up. Don't worry, but if you're one of my students, then you need to know this stuff for the final. So first off, finding areas between curves. So we'll get we'll warm up with a nice basic problem. Find the area enclosed by the given curves. We have y equals 2x minus x squared and y equals 2x minus 4. Now Nowhere in the directions does it say graph, but you absolutely must graph every single time. Okay, don't even think about trying to get away with doing the problem without graphing, especially if you go to Calc 3. Forget it. So before we start putting a graph together, I need to figure out the intersection for these two curves. So I'm going to set 2x minus x squared equal to 2x minus 4. I can see 2x is going to cancel out on both sides. Negative x squared equals negative 4. That means x squared is positive 4. So x is plus or minus 2. And then let's figure out what the y coordinates are for these points of intersection. So I'll just substitute them in here. If x is positive 2, then y is going to be 0. And if x is negative 2, y is going to be negative 8. Okay, so I can tell y equals 2x minus x squared. That's going to be a parabola opening downward y equals 2x minus 4 that's just a line and i know where this parabola and line are going to intersect fabulous here's x-axis y-axis negative 1 2 and then negative 8 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 okay they intersect right here and then they also intersect at positive 2 0 so right here. Okay, well I already know how to graph the line. Whoop. I'll make this a little bigger. Yeah, because the y-intercept is negative 4. Boom. And then the parabola 2x minus x squared. Just to get a nice graph going, I can factor out an x and then you have 2 minus x. So I can see here the x-intercepts are at x equals 0 and at x equals 2. So here's an intercept, here's an intercept. That means the vertex of the parabola, that's going to be halfway between at 1. The y-coordinate will be 1. So it looks something like this. And then it comes all the way down over here. Maybe I should match it on the other side. Let's make it come down just as far. Beautiful. Okay. So we have to find the area enclosed by these two curves. That's going to be this area. And based on the way the functions are written, it looks like we're going to want to integrate with respect to x, which means we have to set up our area so that the base of each little rectangle is delta x and the height would be top curve minus bottom curve. And yeah, that works out. So the height of each of these rectangles to give us the area is going to be top curve minus bottom curve. Which curve is on the top? The parabola 2x minus x squared minus the bottom curve is 2x minus 4. So this is going to simplify to negative x squared plus 4. And then the base of each of these rectangles is delta x, which becomes dx when we integrate. Okay, now we're ready to set up our integral. So the area is going to go from, since we're integrating with respect to x, they need to be limits in terms of x that bound the region. And this region here begins where x equals negative 2 and it ends where x equals positive 2. So those are my limits of integration. So area equals definite integral from negative 2 to 2. 
of base times height. So negative x squared plus 4 and delta x becomes dx. Okay? Good. Now, a lot of the time, <laughs> if, if we have a region that is symmetric with respect to the y-axis, you can double it and go from 0 to 2. We cannot do that here because this region is not symmetric with respect to the y-axis. So don't do anything illegal. Um, let's just go ahead and anti-differentiate term by term. Antiderivative of negative x squared is negative 1 third x cubed plus this is 4x from negative 2 to 2. Okay, now let's substitute in our limits of integration. We have negative 1 third times 2 cubed, that's 8, plus 4 times 2 is 8, minus negative 1 third times negative 2 cubed is negative 8, plus 4 times negative 2, that's minus 8. So this gives me, let's see here, I have negative 8 thirds plus 8 minus another 8 thirds plus another 8. So that's negative 16 thirds plus 16. So that's going to be 32 thirds. Okay. Now, depending on the region, sometimes you're going to have to integrate with respect to y, and then you would do right minus left. Um, for the sake of time so that this video isn't five hours long, I'm not going to cover every possible scenario for every single section. So if you want more details, more examples, then you can go back through the video lectures. I'll link the playlist in the description box along with the titles for some of the key video lectures. Okay, moving on. Next topic, volumes. And these are volumes from taking a region, a bounded area, and revolving it about a certain axis. When you're in Calc 3, you'll compute volumes that arise from different methods, okay? Not spinning stuff. So first method we're going to go over involves using disks or washers to compute the volume. And just remember, for disks and washers, we slice perpendicular to the axis of rotation, okay? So if you have a disk, then the volume is given by definite integral from a to b of pi r squared. This could be dx or dy, depending which way you're slicing, but if you're spinning around the x-axis, then perpendicular slices mean you integrate with respect to x. If you have a washer, because you have a hole in the middle of the region, then the definite integral for the volume would be pi, capital R squared minus pi lowercase r squared. Capital R is the outer radius. Ooh. Outer radius. And then lowercase r is the inner radius, okay? All right, good. So let's look at an example here. Find the volume of the solid generated by revolving the region bounded by the given lines and curves about the x-axis, and then I added in. You must include a clearly labeled sketch of the region. Of course you must. Okay, so y equals negative 7x plus 14 and y equals 7x. Those are the two curves, and we're also bounding the region with x equals 0. That's the y-axis. First things first, we need to figure out the intersection for these curves. So let's do it. So I'm going to set negative 7x plus 14 equal to 7x. That gives me 14 equals 14x. So they intersect when x is 1. Okay, if x is 1, y is going to be 7. All right, so let's see. We're going to primarily stay in the first quadrant, right? Yes, because we're bounding these two curves that intersect in the first quadrant with the y-axis. And then let's see. So one of them is negative 7x plus 14. That means the y-intercept is at 14. And then the other one is just y equals 7x. Now, this is my graph. I'm going to scale it how I wish in a way that makes sense for me. So, you know. I'm scaling by sevens in the y direction and by one 
in the x direction, and that's totally appropriate. They intersect at 1, 7. This would be y equals 7x right here. And then negative 7x plus 14. Slope here. Boom, boom. Okay. Now also, you have to identify the region that you're spinning correctly. X equals 0, that's the y-axis. So the y-axis, this curve, and this curve bound the region. This is the region that we're spinning. Okay, don't pick the wrong triangle. Don't be a goober and think it's this. No one said y equals zero is bounding the region. Okay, this is getting spun about the x-axis. So we're going this way. So just imagine if you had spun it, that original region would get revolved or reflected below the x-axis. And if we're gonna slice perpendicular to the axis of revolution, then notice we have a washer situation, okay? If you're spinning around the x-axis, perpendicular slices move in the x direction, so we're gonna integrate with respect to x, which is easier. Notice the functions are given to me in terms of x, so. I want to use washers in this case. If I if I were trying to do shells, that's coming next, you would peel parallel to the axis of revolution, so you would integrate with respect to y. And I, I don't want to have to rearrange these equations so they're in terms of y and do the problem that way. Okay, plus you'd have to set up two integrals. So anyways, let's see if we can identify outer radius, inner radius, okay? Always look at the original region before you spun it to figure out what the radius is. So outer radius goes from there to the center, okay? You could always think top minus bottom to figure out the top curve here is, yes, negative seven X plus 14. What's on the bottom? We're just spinning around y uh, x axis, excuse me, y equals zero. So it's negative seven x plus 14 minus zero, which you don't see. Okay, what about the inner radius? Inside radius goes from here down there. So what's bounding it on the top? y equals seven x, what's bounding it below? Zero, you don't have to put the minus zero, but that's kind of what's going on, okay? Maybe I'll write it just so for trickier scenarios, you're already thinking that way. Okay, then we're gonna set up our integral for the volume. It's pi times definite integral. These limits need to be for x for the region before we spun it. So from zero to one, right? The region exists when x is zero up until one. And then you have outer radius squared so that would be negative 7x plus 14. This gets squared minus inner radius squared separately dx, okay? So don't subtract them and then square it. You square each of them separately, then subtract them. Okay, this integral is not too bad. You just gotta keep your wits about you so you don't multiply or do something incorrectly. You don't wanna multiply wrong. Okay, negative seven X plus 14 squared. That's gonna be 49 X squared. Middle term is two times seven times 14. So that's gonna be 14 squared, basically 196 X plus 196 minus seven X squared. That's 49 X squared DX. And then notice these 49 X squareds cancel. I can take out 196 and paste, uh, take it outside the integral. So we have 196 pi times the integral from zero to one, negative x plus one, which is one minus x dx. Oh, now this is an easy integral. So 196 pi antiderivative is gonna be x minus one half x squared from zero to one. So this is 196 pi times one minus one half minus zero. So one minus one half, that's a half. A half of 96 pi is 98 pi. Boom. All right, good. Let's do one more and then we'll move on to shells. 
So find the volume of the solid generated by revolving the region about the given line. We have the region bounded above by the line y equals 9, below by the curve y equals 9 minus x squared, on the right by the line x equals 3, and we're spinning about the line y equals 9. So that means wherever y equals 9 is, we're spinning around it. So I'm just going to put a lot, a lot in the positive y direction. So here's nine, we're spinning around it. And then one, two, three, the region's bounded above by y equals nine, that's here. Below by the curve nine minus x squared. So nine minus x squared, that's a parabola. Opening down, intercepts are plus or minus three. On the right, it's bounded by the line x equals 3. So where's the region? It's right here. And we're spinning this region about the line y equals 9, spinning that way. So after we spin it, it's going to look something like that. And if I slice perpendicular to the axis of rotation, I have a nice washer I'm going to integrate with respect to x. Okay, now here's the deal. We don't have an outer radius and an inner radius. Okay, we've got a disc. Here is the one and only radius. <laughs> Always use the original region before you spun it. So to figure out the radius, just do top minus bottom. What curve defines the boundary right here on the top? It's y equals 9. So the radius is 9 minus what's bounding the radius on the bottom? It's the parabola 9 minus x squared. So just like for area between curves, when you found the height, you did top minus bottom, you do the same thing for the radius here. Okay, this is top of the radius, bottom of the radius. What's bounding it on top? Y equals 9. What's bounding it below? The parabola. So if I clean this up, this is going to be 9 minus 9. That'll cancel, and then this gives me positive x squared. Okay, good. Now to find the volume, we have pi. The limits are for x. The original region was bounded from 0 to 3. And then you have the radius squared. Oh, what a harmless little integral. So pi 0 to 3 x to the fourth dx. So that's 1 fifth x to the fifth. So pi over 5 times x to the fifth from 0 to 3. That's just going to be 3 to the fifth minus 0. So 243 pi over 5. Voila, not so bad, okay? Good, now we're gonna look at the other method that I mentioned earlier, which is the method of shells, cylindrical shells. So the formula, if you're using cylindrical shells to compute volumes is volume equals integral from A to B of two pi R H D X. And you're gonna peel parallel to the axis of rotation. So opposite direction from disks and washers, okay? So next example, use the shell method to find the volume of the solid generated by revolving the shaded region about the indicated axis. Oh, how nice, they already gave us a graph. And we're spinning this region, for example, for about the y-axis. So we're spinning this way, okay? And we always peel parallel to the axis of revolution. So my students always have a hard time drawing the cylindrical shells. Here's the trick, ready? Okay, we're spinning around the y-axis and we peel parallel. So please draw for me a line segment in the original region, in the shaded region, parallel to the y-axis, right? Whatever you're spinning around, draw something. Contained only within the region though. So something parallel to the y-axis anywhere over here that your heart desires. I just felt like putting it right there in the middle. So here is the height of one of your cylinders. Please reflect it onto the other side. Okay, I'm gonna reflect it over here. 
Then loop it together, draw yourself a little cylinder. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. This was the height right here, okay? This down here, this is your radius. Now we have to figure out what they are for this particular problem, radius and height. I'm gonna say something profound, please take note. The radius, when you're doing cylindrical shells, never involves the function that bounds the region or functions. The radius is always just plain old X or plain old Y if you're spinning around the X axis or Y axis. If you spin around some other line like Y equals nine, X equals one, then you'll have a constant in there along with X or Y, but this will never involve like this function here. No, no, no. So if I'm spinning around the Y axis, I'm gonna peel parallel, I'm gonna integrate with respect to X. Ooh. And the radius is just X, okay? If I drew another cylinder over here, like this, the radius would be whatever X is right there. So the radius is X. It's always plain old X or plain old Y. The only time you would involve a number is if you're spinning around something other than X axis or Y axis. Now what's the height? It's right here. Top minus bottom. Top curve, they gave it to me here. Four sine X over X. Bottom is just Y equals zero. So you won't see the minus zero part, but I'll write it so we know we thought about it. Four sine X over X minus zero. So just four sine x over x. Okay, now let's set up this integral. It's not gonna be bad, watch this. Volume is, put the two pi outside, please. Limits of integration should be for x, whatever bounded the original region. So that's gonna be zero to pi. And then you have radius, which is x times height, four sine x over x dx. Oh, so lovely. So x cancels out. And then let's see now, 2 pi and 4. I'm going to take that out. So we have 8 pi integral 0 to pi sine x dx. Antiderivative of sine x is negative cosine x. Let's put the negative all the way outside. And then we'll do cosine x evaluated from 0 to pi. So I have negative eight pi times cosine of pi minus cosine of zero. Cosine of pi, that's negative one, minus cosine of zero is one. So this is negative eight pi times negative two, which gives us 16 pi. Okay, very nice. Let's do one more, a little more spicy. Okay, mm -hmm. that one was too easy, huh? Yeah, I would probably never put that on an exam. So use the shell method to find the volume of the solid generated by revolving the region bounded by the given curves and lines about the x-axis. So we've got x equals 18 minus y squared, x equals y squared, and y equals zero bounding the region. Now I can tell these are two parabolas opening horizontally. So let's figure out where they intersect. So I'm gonna set 18 minus y squared equal to y squared. That means 18 equals two y squared. So y squared is nine. So y is plus or minus three. And I can just look back here. If y is three or negative three, x is nine. So these two parabolas intersect at nine plus or minus three. I'm also bounding the region with y equals zero. So that's going to be x-axis. Okay. Good. And then we're spinning the region about the x-axis as well. Oh, okay. Fabulous. So let's just draw the portion. Of the graph that we're going to spin. So we've got intersection at nine and three and negative three. Okay, so 
they intersect here and here. So x equals y squared is just going to open up like this. Okay. x equals 18 minus y squared. Oh, you know what? I need a little more x-axis. I do. Because we have to go all the way to 18 for that guy. Oh, heavens. Okay. So that's 9. That looks like about 18 right there. So 18 minus y squared, if um, y is 0, x is 18, and then it'll intersect right here. So this parabola is going this way. Okay. And then we're also bounding the region with y equals 0. So you might say, well, do I use the top half or the bottom half to spin around the x-axis? I mean, it doesn't matter, just pick a half. <laughs> You're only spinning half of it though. Um, let's just take the top half, okay? Pick a half and then we're gonna spin it around the x-axis. And so it's just gonna reflect, you know, over here. It's gonna look like a little football, like a deformed football. Okay, so here's the thing. We need to use the method of cylindrical shells because we were instructed to do so, and I need to figure out the radius and the height. What did we spin around? We spun around the x-axis. Please draw for me a line segment parallel to the x-axis in the original region that we spun. So in here, can you please draw a line segment for me in this direction? Why, yes, we can, right here, boom. Okay, this is the height. That line segment is the height. Mirror it on the other side. Then draw in the rest to make it look like a cylinder, okay? And there you have your radius. So the radius is gonna go from the center out. Ooh, I'll just draw it like this. That's the radius and then there's the height. Now the height in this case, we're not gonna do top minus bottom because we're gonna integrate with respect to y. So you're gonna think of right minus left. Which curves bound the height of the cylinder? Well, on the right is this parabola. Which one was that guy? That was 18 minus y squared. So we have 18 minus y squared minus, what's bounding it on the left? y squared. So this is 18 minus 2y squared. What's the radius? The radius is just y. Okay, we only spun around the x-axis, nothing fancy schmancy. So now we're ready to go. Volume is going to be 2 pi. Limits should be for y on the original region that we spun. So the original region, we chose to spin the top half from 0 to 3. Then you're going to have radius, which is y, times height, which is 18 minus 2y squared, dy. Okay, the worst is over. The setup is always the gnarliest part. So then we've got 2 pi integral 0 to 3. This is 18y minus 2y cubed dy. And then we can go ahead and integrate term by term 2 pi. This is going to be 9y squared minus 1 half y to the fourth from 0 to 3. And then we have 2 pi times 9 times 3 squared minus 1 half times 3 to the 4th minus 0. So that's 2 pi times 81 minus 81 halves. So that's 2 pi times 81 halves. So this is just 81 pi. Woo! Okay. It can definitely get trickier. I have more examples in my full-length video lectures, but this is just enough to give you like a refresher if you feel like it's something that you're shaky on, which a lot of students are, then go back and do more practice on volumes, for sure, for sure. Okay, next topic we're going to look at is work. Um, this is just a general recap. Work is based first on the idea of force. Force is a push or a pull on an object, and force is equal to, it can be equal to mass times acceleration, and instead of acceleration, I have second derivative of position function with respect to time. If you are in the metric system, 
then your units are newtons. Newtons are kilograms times meters per second squared. That's all one newton. If we're in the US customary system, we use pounds or imperial system. And then if acceleration is constant, then force is also constant. And so the work done can be given by force times distance or displacement. And the units for work are joules if you're in the metric system or if you're in the US customary system, it's a foot pound, kind of weird, I know. And then the most common application that we're gonna cover is when force is not constant, but variable. And then you integrate your force function times dx, okay? And so I'm gonna do the, the trickiest kind of problem that my students all hate. <laughs> um, the work problems where you're pumping stuff out of tanks, all right? So a conical tank is resting on its apex. So what does that mean? That means it looks like this, guys. It looks like ice cream cone. Okay. The height of the tank is eight feet and the radius at the top is seven feet. So this is eight. And then across here is seven. Fabulous. The tank is full of gasoline weighing 45 pounds per feet cubed. How much work will it take to pump the gasoline to the top? Give your answer to the nearest foot pound. Okay, so I'm going to need to integrate force required to pump the gasoline out of the tank. Force, if we're in US customary units, is measured in pounds. And they've given me here the weight density of gasoline, pounds per feet cubed. So I need to cancel out basically the feet cubed so that I can have some sort of representation of the force required to pump out the gasoline from the tank. So feet cubed is volume. So you always start these problems by figuring out what's the volume, not of the whole tank, no, the volume of just one slice and I know it's impossible to actually like slice up a tank of gasoline, but we pretend because that's how we define integration. We always take a region and we chop it up, right? When you first learned integrals, you chopped up the region into a bunch of rectangles. So here I have this region that I wanna figure out the work for. I'm gonna chop it up into a bunch of hypothetical slices of gasoline, okay? So there's a slice of gasoline, do you like it? The volume is gonna be area of the base area of the base times the height times the thickness the thickness right there okay well area of the base it's a circle so it's going to be pi r squared and then the thickness of one slice i'm going to call delta x some people call it delta y it's up to you i'm going to count it where like this is the slice at x equals zero and since this tank is uh, eight feet high, this is the slice at x equals eight. So I don't know, this is the slice at x sub i. Okay. Now, I wanna see, can I express the volume in terms of x pi r squared? Here's the thing, depending where you slice, the radius is changing, isn't it? Isn't the radius of this slice up here different than the radius of the slice I drew lower? So how can I express radius in terms of x? Well, here's the radius of an arbitrary slice right there. And then this is the height that it's at, some arbitrary x sub i. So you have similar triangles. Yes, you do. This is the radius. This is x. And this is nestled inside the big cone with radius seven and height eight. So we, similar triangles are in proportion to each other. I can set up common ratio. Seven over eight is equal to R over X. Yes, good. And then I'm trying to solve for R in terms of X. So that means seven eighths X is equal to R. So now I'm gonna just basically plug that in here to get the volume of one slice in terms of X. And you know what, instead of calling it volume of one slice, I'll call it delta V, less writing, same thing. So it's pi times 7 eighths X squared 
delta x. And the units on this would be feet cubed, right? Because this is representing a volume. So this is 49 pi over 64 x squared delta x feet cubed. Now, I want the force required to lift one slice. So force to lift one slice of gasoline is going to be the weight density, which they gave us here, 45 pounds per feet cubed. So you just take 45 pounds per feet cubed and you multiply it by your delta V, which is in feet cubed. Those are the units on it. See, this will cancel with this. And then now I have 45 times 49 pi over 64 x squared delta x pounds. Okay? Mm-hmm. Great. 45 times 49 pi, in case you're dying to know, it's 2,205 pi over 64 x squared delta x. Okay, the last thing I need is the displacement of each slice or the distance that each slice moves. So let's go back to the picture really quickly, okay? So work is force times distance. The, the layer of gasoline whose height is at x equals zero needs to be moved or move a total distance of eight feet to be out of the tank, right? What about the gasoline that's already all the way at the top? How many feet does it have to move? Zero, right? What about the layer at one foot high? It moves seven feet. So at X height, it moves eight minus X to be out of the tank. So that's the displacement of each slice, eight minus X. For how I set up my picture, you could set it up different. Okay, so now let's write our integral out the work is going to be definite integral. You're only doing work on wherever there's gasoline in the tank. And they told me it was all the way full, right? Yes, they did. It's full. So we're going to be doing work all the way from 0 to 8. Those are my limits. 0 to 8. I have force here. So that's 2205 pi over 64 x squared delta x becomes dx times this displacement 8 minus x okay don't get scared by the integral take the constant outside immediately 2205 pi over 64 then you have integral 0 to 8 x squared times 8 minus x dx and then we can distribute the x squared, 2205 pi over 64, integral 0 to 8. This is 8x squared minus x cubed dx. And see now the rest is not so bad. So you have 2205 pi over 64. This is going to be 8 thirds x cubed minus one fourth x to the fourth evaluated from zero to eight. So what is that? 2205 pi over 64. If I plug in this eight for x, I'm gonna have eight cubed times another eight. That's eight to the fourth over three minus eight to the fourth over four, lower limit zero. I can factor out this 8 to the 4th, so then I'm going to have 8 to the 4th times 2205 pi over 64 times 1 3rd minus 1 4th. Uh, 64 cancels with 8 to the 4th, and this just becomes 8 squared, which is 64. So I have 64 times 2205 pi. One third minus one fourth is one twelfth. So this is over 12. 64 and 12 can cancel. 
this, I can divide a four out from each. So this will be 16 and three. And then now I know everything's reduced. I can't cancel out any further. So I'll multiply 16 by 2205 and you get 35,280 pi over three. What are our units? The ever lovely foot pound. Woo woo. Okay, that's it. Notice I did not reach for a calculator until this very last step. I don't let my students have one at all. I give them slightly nicer numbers so they won't need it here. But you know, learn to use your brain, the calculator you were born with, and clean up as much as possible. Only use the calculator if your teacher allows you when absolutely necessary. Okay, good. Glad we had that talk, I feel better. Um, all right, next topic is average value. If you're, we know about averages, right? If you just wanna average something, you take all of the somethings, add them up, divide by how many somethings you had. Fabulous. If you want the average value of a function, same idea. You add up all of the values of the function. How do we add up infinitely many things in math? We take an integral and we do it on the interval that's given from A to B. And then you want to divide by however many there are. Well, there's infinitely many on the interval from A to B. You just divide by the length of the interval, B minus A. Okay. So here, let's look at a common application. Find the average value of the function over the given interval. Find C such that F equals the average value of the function over the interval. And then sketch the graph of F and a rectangle whose area is the same as the area under the graph of F. Okay, so first things first, find the average value. So you just have to know the formula. Part A, F average is one over B minus A, so that would be two minus negative three times the definite integral from A to B, negative three to two of F of X dx. Okay, this is a relaxing little integral. One fifth times the definite integral from negative three to two, six minus X squared dx. So let's see, this is one fifth times six x minus one third x cubed from negative three to two. So we have one fifth times 12 minus eight thirds minus negative 18 plus 27 thirds, that's just nine. So this is gonna be one fifth times, I'm already doing this, 12 plus 18, that's 30. And then I have negative eight thirds minus 27 thirds. So that's minus 35 thirds, right? Yes. <laughs> and then 30 is 90 thirds minus 35 thirds, that's 55 thirds. So I have one fifth times 55 thirds and that reduces to 11 thirds. So that's the average value. That's the average height of the function. If you want to think of it that way, that's the average y value of y equals six x squared on the interval from negative three to two. That's the average height, okay? Now part B said find C such that F of C equals the average value. Well, F of C would be six minus C squared, six minus C squared and they want that to equal 11 thirds. Okay, so that means six minus 11 thirds is C squared. Six is 18 thirds. 18 minus 11, that's seven thirds equals C squared. So C equals plus or minus rad seven thirds. Now C needs to be on the interval from negative three to two. So you would need a little calculator just to kind of eyeball. I know, well, I know seven thirds, you know, that's more than two. So the square root's gonna be more than one. It's gonna be less than two though, cause seven thirds is less than four, right? So whatever this square root is, it's between one and two. It's about 1.53 and both are in the interval. 
So we have two values of C. I'll say C1 is negative rad 7 thirds and C2 is positive rad 7 thirds. Okay. And then there's one more part. Sketch the graph of F and a rectangle whose area is the same as the area under the graph of F. So we're going to graph F on the interval from negative 3 to 2 and then a rectangle whose area is the same, well, the height of the rectangle is going to be the average value. That's the whole point of this, okay? I need an extra page. I didn't know this problem would take so long. Here we go. So I'm going to graph f of x equals 6 minus x squared on negative 3 to 2, okay? Very good. So let's hop to it. Um, let's see. I'm just quickly in my head, if I plug in negative three for X, what does that give me? Nine, six minus nine, negative three. Okay, so I don't need to go too low in the Y direction. I need to go up to six though, don't I? Okay, so something like this should be good. Here's my X axis, here's my Y axis. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, like that. Okay. One, two, three, one, two. That's as far as we're going. Okay, so six minus x squared goes through zero, six. Negative three, negative three. Okay, and then x intercept is rad six. I don't know, it's between two and three. Who cares where? Pretend that's rad six right there where I crossed. And then at 2, if I plug in 2 for x, 6 minus 4 is 2. So it's going to go to here. Okay, don't go past that. Don't get crazy. So area under the curve is going to be this portion. This is positive area. And then this little sliver, baby sliver here, is negative area. Okay? Good. Now we need a rectangle that has the same area. Well, the height of the rectangle, that's why we found the average value. It's 11 thirds. 11 thirds, 3 and 2 thirds. A wee bit more than 3. So say maybe it's like right here. I'm going to say that's 11 thirds. Okay? And it's going to go all the way from negative 3 to 2. Okay. I think I overshot it there. Hold on. Let's fix that. Okay. That much better. Beautiful. That is a rectangle whose area is the same. Boom, boom. There you go. So the height of the rectangle, maybe you can't see it so well, the height right here is 11 thirds. The base is the same. The base is going to be from negative 3 to 2, okay, which is 5. Perfect. 11 thirds times 5 gives you 55 thirds, which should be the total area under the curve of 6 minus x squared from negative 3 to 2. Um, what was the whole point of C1 and C2? I'll show you right now. Where they intersect, right here. That's our C2. That's positive rad 7 thirds. And then over here, that's C1. That's negative rad 7 thirds. Okay. That should be good for average value. Just remember the formula and the idea. Now we're moving on to the next topic, which is probably one of my favorites, techniques of integration. And we're going to start with a review of integration by parts. So the formula when you're applying integration by parts to evaluate an integral is that you start off with the integral of u dv. you got to figure out what to let u be and what to let dv be. And then that is equal to uv minus the integral of v du. So <clears throat> when to use integration by parts, when you have a product of two functions and you need to evaluate their antiderivative and u sub will not work, okay? 
so I always default to U sub as like my first go-to when I'm trying to solve an integral. And I'm looking here at this example, y times tan inverse of y. No, no U sub will save me here. And I have an obvious product of uh, two functions. Y is one of them, and the other one is tan inverse of y. So now it just comes down to deciding who's going to be u and who's going to be dv. We're going to pick that. Keep in mind, you have to be able to figure out du and v before you proceed. So a lot of the times, only pick dv to be something that you can anti-differentiate. Meaning, I know there's no way tan inverse of y is going to be dv, because we don't know the antiderivative off the top of our heads for tan inverse of y. That means tan inverse of y is going to be u, and then dv is obviously going to have to be what's left over, which is y dy. All right. And then from here, let's figure out u, du and v, excuse me. So du, derivative of tan inverse of y, that's 1 over 1 plus y squared dy. How do I know that? I memorized it a long time ago. So you do need to just memorize all your bread and butter derivatives from Calc 1. No way around it. If you haven't, pull it together quick as a bunny, memorize it. Okay, V is antiderivative of Y, so that's gonna be one half Y squared. We don't put a plus C when we do integration by parts. Also, we have limits of integration here. So, this is going to be equal to, look back here, we have UV. I just always think it's this diagonal product because I always set it up the same way. So u times v, that's 1 half y squared times tan inverse of y. I'm going to list that this is to be evaluated from 0 to 1. That part does not get integrated again. It's done. Minus integral from 0 to 1. And then what's here? Integral of v times du. v du is right here, people. So that's going to be 1 half y squared times 1 over 1 plus y squared dy. Are you all right? Fabulous. Okay, so we've got here 1 half y squared tan inverse of y from 0 to 1. I'm not going to evaluate it now. I'll, I'll do it all at the end when I'm done integrating. Minus, I want to take this 1 half out, okay? Get in the habit of taking your constants outside of the integral. It'll make life easier. Then we have 0 to 1. I'm going to rewrite this as y squared over 1 plus y squared. Okay, so y squared over 1 plus y squared dy. Now, how to integrate y squared over 1 plus y squared? Well, look, degree of the numerator is 2. Degree of the denominator is also 2. So we need to do long division. Anytime the degree of the numerator is greater than or equal to degree of the denominator, do long division. I'm going to show you a shortcut so you don't have to do long division. Ooh. So I notice I have 1 plus y squared in the denominator. I wish I had 1 plus y squared in the numerator. It would make life easier. So I'm going to add 1 and subtract 1. So really, I just did nothing, right? Don't freak out. And then watch what's going to happen. So I'm just going to rewrite this first term here. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Minus 1 half. Okay, this is the best part right here. Integral, 0 to 1. Now we have these two I'm going to write over the denominator. So we've got y squared plus 1 over 1 plus y squared minus, and then this little guy's all on his own. Okay, look at him, so brave. Minus 1 over 1 plus y squared dy. And what was the point of that? I don't have to do long division. This is my little shortcut way, so I don't do long division. Does it always work? No. But when you have just one little term in the numerator that matches one of the terms in the denominator, then you can just add and subtract whatever constant you need to make it happen. If you hate this, then just do the long division. You'll get the same thing. Okay, 1 half y squared tan inverse of y from 0 to 1 minus 1 half integral 0 to 1. This right here, this first term, is just going to reduce to 1, isn't it? I have same thing in the numerator and denominator. 
minus, and then just leave this alone, 1 over 1 plus y squared dy. Fabulous. You should be able to integrate this now. I'm serious. So 1 half y squared, tan inverse of y from 0 to 1, minus 1 half, antiderivative of 1 is going to be y, minus, we should know antiderivative of 1 over 1 plus y squared. Yes, it's tan inverse of y. And you know what? This is getting evaluated from 0 to 1, so I'm just going to go ahead and add another little bracket, 0 to 1, get rid of this one, and say all of this is getting evaluated from 0 to 1. Okay? Good. Before I move there, though, let's distribute everything and make it as simple as possible. So we've got 1 half y squared tan inverse of y minus 1 half y plus 1 half tan inverse of y, and this is evaluated from 0 to 1. And then, oh, looks like I need more room. Okay, there we go. So we have, I'm going to plug in 1 now, the upper limit. 1 half times 1 squared times tan inverse of 1 is pi over 4. Yes, you should know that. Minus 1 half times 1 plus 1 half times tan inverse of 1 again, pi over 4. That's the upper limit. Minus, if I plug in 0, um, first term is going to be 0 minus 0 plus 1 half times tan inverse of 0 is also 0. So what are we left with? This is pi over 8 minus a half plus pi over 8. So I have 2 pi over 8. That's pi over 4 minus a half. Ooh, good. Very good. I love it. How was that? Yeah, if you need like more basic examples, then you can go back to the video lecture on integration by parts. I figured we're reviewing for the final. Let's keep the spice level intense, all right? So here's another favorite of mine. We have integral of e to the 2x cosine 7x dx. This one, you need to do integration by parts twice because it boomerangs. Boomerangs meaning the original integral comes back after your second iteration of integration by parts. And how do I know that that's gonna happen just by looking at it? Well. I know the derivative of e to the x always involves e to the x. It's cyclical. And same thing for cosine 7x. After four derivatives, you get back to basically the original function, uh, albeit with some adjustments for, for the constants, but that's the idea. So whenever you have a mix, a product of two functions whose derivatives are both cyclical, then it works out that you have this little boomerang situation. Okay, and the cool thing is it actually doesn't matter which function you let be u and which you let be dv, as long as you're consistent through both iterations. So I'll show you what I mean. So let's just pick u to be e to the 2x, simply because it was first. And then dv is going to be cosine 7x dx. All right, and then let's find du. So du would be 2e to the 2x dx, and v antiderivative of cosine 7x is going to be a positive 1 7 sine 7x. All right, so this original integral, I'm going to write it e to the 2x cosine 7x dx is equal to uv What's that going to be? That's going to be 1 7 e to the 2x sine 7x minus integral of vdu. vdu is this product right here. So that's going to be 2 over 7 e to the 2x sine 7x dx. Okay. I'm going to perform integration by parts again on this integral right here. Again, notice I have product of e and trig function. Okay. Um, you have to just match up. If, if u was the exponential function and dv was the trig function, then choose it the same way here at this step. Okay. You can take the constant out or you can put it in here. It's kind of up to you. I'm 
call it something else. You can't call it just U again and DV again. U bar and DV bar is usually the appropriate choice for round two. So U bar I will call two sevenths e to the two x and then dv bar is sine seven x dx then du bar would be derivative so that's four sevenths e to the two x dx and then v bar would be a negative one seventh cosine seven x dx all right good so let's see what we're left with now i don't feel like writing out this whole integral on the left hand side I'm just gonna call it I okay so I represents all of this that's I and that equals 1 7 e to the 2x sine 7 X minus and then now we have u bar V bar so that's 2 7 times negative 1 7 so that's negative 2 over 49 e to the 2x, there's no dx here, what was I thinking? Shame on me. Um, cosine 7x minus integral of v bar du bar. So that would be 4 over 49 negative. So I'll make this a plus 4 over 49 e to the 2x cosine 7x dx close it up. Okay, let's clean this up a bit more. So I have on the left i, my original integral equals 1 7 e to the 2x sine 7x plus 2 over 49 e to the 2x cosine 7x. I'm distributing this minus sign. Minus, let's take the 4 over 49 out, integral e to the 2x cosine 7x dx and then this is where the boomerang happens so notice can you notice that this integral that I still have here is the same as the original one that we started with who we have now called I all right so we're solving for I just like you solve for X in basic equations back in the day when you were in algebra and life was relaxing and you didn't even realize it. So I'm going to replace this whole integral with i. So I have 4 over 49i, negative, and then here I have i equals 1 7 e to the 2x sine 7x plus 2 over 49 e to the 2x cosine 7x, yada yada. Okay. If I'm trying to solve for i, then I want all the i's on the same side of the equation. So I'm going to add 4 over 49i here, add 4 over 49i here. Technically, this 1i is 49 over 49i. So on the left-hand side, I now have 53 over 49i equals 1 7 e to the 2x sine 7x plus 2 over 49 e to the 2x cosine 7x. And then the last thing that we need to do is just multiply everything by 49 over 53, all right, to isolate i. And then we have i equals, I'm distributing this through, 49 and 7 are going to cancel, so I have 7 over 53 e to the 2x sine 7x plus, boom. This is going to be, well, the 49s cancel, so we have 2 over 53 e to the 2x cosine 7x. And then here's the part that's just tricky because you have to remember to put plus c at the very end. Since this was an indefinite integral, we have no limits of integration, we need a plus c. All right, that's it. I really do love these. If they're obnoxious to you, that just means you need to practice them more. Okay, very good. One more by parts. Um, and I like this one because you need to actually use multiple integration techniques. Um, notice I have a composition of functions. I have cosine of natural log of x. So it's not really set up just yet. I don't have a product of two functions to do integration by parts. 
but I'm feeling like maybe it's gonna go there. I don't know. So let's just try doing a substitution. I'm not gonna do a U sub, because I wanna save the variable U in case I have to do integration by part. So I'm gonna just substitute out with T. What should I let T be? Uh, just take a guess. A lot of the times, if you have a composition of functions, let it be the inside function, okay? I'm just playing around, guys. I'm just playing around. So let T equal natural log of X. Um, you could find dt now, but it's easier. Let's rewrite this equation in exponential form. So that means e to the t is equal to x, right? That's the same thing. All right, now if I differentiate both sides, that means e to the t dt equals dx. So let's rewrite this integral now in terms of t. So I have antiderivative cosine. Instead of ln of x, I'm going to write t. And then dx gets replaced with e to the t dt. And then this is going to be another little boomerangy one. Yes, it is. Okay, so we're going to pick u and we're going to pick dv. Can you see how we have a product of two functions? There's one function, there's the other one. So u, dv. Do you want to pause the video? Give this one a try on your own. I think you can handle it. Yes, you should try. Okay, u is e to the t. dv will be cosine t dt. And then du e to the t dt, v is sine t. So already I know I'm calling this integral i, it equals uv, so that's e to the t sine t minus integral v du, so that's gonna be e to the t sine t dt. Now with the boomerang ones, you gotta go two rounds, okay? So we need a u bar and a dv bar. Pick them uh, the same way that you picked round one. Otherwise, you undo what you did. You'll see what I mean. I've done I've done it wrong plenty of times back in the day when I was first learning. So I'm giving you tips so you don't make the mistakes I made. So u bar should again be e to the t, the exponential function, and then dv bar sine t dt. Du bar will be e to the t dt, v bar. Ooh, antiderivative of sine t is negative cosine t. Okay, so now my integral is equal to, sorry, that i looks so ugly. Okay, e to the t sine t minus, all right, we've got u bar v bar, so that's negative e to the t cosine t minus integral v bar du bar which is going to be a negative e to the t cosine t dt. So I'll switch this to plus e to the t cosine t dt. Woo. <gasps> Look, this is my original integral i, and here it is. The boomerang came back. I'll circle actually the whole thing, right? There's my boomerang. Well, isn't this our lucky day? Okay, so this is i, this whole thing. So we have i equals e to the t sine t plus e to the t cosine t minus i, right? This is this negative's distributing. And then add i to both sides. We're trying to solve for it. So now we have 2i equals e to the t sine t plus e to the t cosine t. Last thing, divide by 2. So i equals 1 half e to the t sine t plus 1 half e to the t cosine t. And then don't forget, plus c. Should we box it? I feel so good about life. No. Remember we did a u sub at first? The original integral was in terms of x. And t is equal to ln of x, which also means e to the t is x. So we got to replace everything. So we're going to have one half x sine of ln of x plus one half x cosine of ln of x plus c. I, you could leave it like that, but you know what it would look so fabulous? Let's factor out the one half x and then we have sine ln of x plus cosine ln of x. Yes, plus c. So stunning. Do you love it? Yes. Good. The more you get excited about doing stuff like this, it'll 
be less torturous, you know? So even if you feel kind of confused by my excitement, hopefully it's contagious and it'll make the process more enjoyable for you. Okay, now let's look at trigonometric integrals. You just have to kind of play around with them, get used to patterns. The biggest thing when you have a mix of sines and cosines, and if one of them is odd, it is your lucky day because you just want to take the odd man out and then do a U sub. You'll see what I mean in just a hot second. So to start, I notice I have an odd power of sine. So I'm going to break this up. 0 to pi over 2 cosine squared 6x times, I'm going to write this as sine squared 6x times sine of 6x dx. So I took the odd power, <laughs> the odd powered trig function and took one of them out. All right. Why am I doing that? Because I want this quantity right here, sine 6x dx, I want this to be my du or du-ish, off by a constant is fine by me. So just think backwards then. Okay, if du is gonna be sine 6x, then what would u need to be? Well, that means u should have been cosine 6x. And then du would be negative six sine 6x dx, but that's no problem. I can deal with like the negative six, okay? So can I replace everything in the integral? all of my cosine six X's with U. Well, this would be U squared. Uh, but what am I gonna do with this sine squared? I'm gonna bust out one of my Pythagorean identities, right? Sine squared six X is one minus cosine squared six X, isn't it? Okay, so let's rewrite it. We have zero to pi over two, cosine squared six X times one minus cosine squared six X times sine six x dx. And then now we're pretty much ready to roll. Why do I say that? So we've got, this is u squared. This is gonna be one minus u squared. And this is almost du. Uh, negative one sixth du is sine six x dx. So call it du, put the negative one sixth outside. Okay, it need not harass you inside the integral. And then we're gonna change the limits of integration. These limits of integration are for the variable x. Now my integral is in terms of u, so I need to change them so that they match. Don't put x limits if your integral is in terms of u. Change them immediately, like a dirty diaper. Don't let it fester. Okay, how do you change them? You go back to right here where you decided what u was, okay? So u is cosine of six x, so that means u of pi over 2, the upper limit, that's going to be cosine of 6 times pi over 2. That's cosine of 3 pi. Cosine of 3 pi is negative 1. And then u of 0 is cosine of 6 times 0. Well, that's the same as cosine of 0, which is positive 1. So my new upper limit is negative 1. My new lower limit is positive 1. Okay, it is what it is. Right off the bat, I'm just going to flip the limits of integration and make this a positive 1 sixth, and then we're going to go from negative 1 to 1. Don't you just feel better already? I certainly do. And then we'll distribute the u squared. So we've got u squared minus u to the fourth du. Woo! Love it. And then now we're ready to anti-differentiate. Oh my goodness, this is no big deal. We did these back in kindergarten. This is going to be 1 third u cubed minus... 1 fifth u to the fifth from negative 1 to 1. Beautiful. And then just keep it going. So we've got 1 sixth. I'm going to plug in positive 1. So this is 1 third minus 1 fifth minus negative 1 cubed is going to stay negative 1. So this is negative 1 third. And then this will be plus 1 fifth. Ooh. So we've got 1 sixth times. Um, this is going to be a positive one-third and minus one-fifth. So that means I have two-thirds minus one-fifth minus one-fifth minus two-fifths. All right. So this is one-sixth times. That's ten minus six 
over 15. How did I get that? I did 2 times 5, that's 10, minus 2 times 3, that's 6, over 3 times 5. There's your 15. Okay. Um, so this is 1 sixth times 10 minus 6 is 4 over 15. Can we reduce? We sure can. This is 2. This is 3. This is 2 over 45. I love it. No, you don't need to go back to the original variable because we changed our limits of integration along the way. So we're ready to roll. Beautiful problem. Beautiful. Okay, so that's for sines and cosines. If one of them's odd, pluck it off. That's going to be du. Play around with it. Make it happen. What if it gets more spicy? What if they're both even? Mm, so nasty. So you have to use half angle identities. If you have sine squared x, replace it with 1 half times 1 minus cosine 2x. If you don't have an odd power of cosine with it to do a u sub. So you're stuck. You can't do a u sub. This is backup plan. Okay. If you have cosine squared x, then you're going to replace it with 1 half times 1 plus cosine 2x. Uh, this double angle, I really wouldn't use it unless I was like extremely desperate. Okay, good. So let's try one out. This is a nasty one. We have definite integral from 0 to 1 half of 3 times sine to the fourth of 2 pi x dx. So notice it's to an even power. I don't have like an odd extra factor of sine or cosine that I can pluck off and do a u sub with. So be careful when you use this um, half angle identity, whatever the argument is here, it gets doubled. So what's the argument right now? It's two pi x, it's going to get doubled. Watch what I mean. You know me, I'm taking this three out right away, zero to one half. And I'm first gonna write this as sine squared two pi x squared dx, right? Isn't that the same thing as sine to the fourth? Okay, now I'm just going to focus right in here and I'm going to replace it with 1 half times 1 minus cosine, double this, double 2 pi x. What does it become? 4 pi x, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And then all of this, my heavens, is squared dx. Then you've got integral 0 to 1 half and a 3. Woo. Okay, check us out. Now, this squared has to distribute to the one half and to this whole thing. So we're gonna have to foil that sucker out. One half squared is one fourth. I want it outside with the three. Now that's a three fourths. Okay, zero to one half. And then you have one minus cosine four pi x quantity squared dx. Can you square it? Yes, yes you can. So 3 fourths integral 0 to 1 half, this is 1 minus 2 cosine 4 pi x plus cosine squared 4 pi x dx. Okay, now let's see. Can we integrate this? Yeah, no problem. Can we integrate this? Sure. I just have to divide by 4 pi. We got it. What do I do with this cosine squared? One more time, half angle. Use this one instead. I remember them. Um, just remember the pattern. And then the cosine one has a plus sign because I feel like cosine, cosine, matchy, matchy, it's so happy. And then sine and cosine, they're not the same. So, you know, opposites. Um, all right. So I'm going to replace cosine squared 4 pi x with 1 half times 1 plus cosine, double this, double this. What's double 4 pi x? 8 pi x. Bravo. Is that what you were saying over there? I hope. Okay, so now we've got 3 fourths integral 0 to 1 half. 1 minus 2 cosine 4 pi x plus, distribute, distribute, 1 half plus 1 half cosine 8 pi x dx. Before I integrate, I can combine like terms, and you always want to do that because then you'll have less stuff 
to integrate. The fewer the terms, the better. So this is 3 halves minus 2 cosine 4 pi x plus 1 half cosine 8 pi x dx. All right, we're almost there. <laughs> um, so we've got 3 fourths times antiderivative of 3 halves. 3 halves x, very good, minus 2 times. So whose derivative did you take to get cosine 4 pi x? Why? It was sine 4 pi x, but I have to divide by 4 pi, right? Divide by whatever coefficients in front of x to undo the chain rule. Think back, if you were to take the derivative, you would multiply by another 4 pi. So we got to undo that. Plus 1 half times. Whose derivative did you take to get cosine 8 pi x? Why? It was sine 8 pi x but I also have to divide by that 8 pi. And then all of this is evaluated from 0 to 1 half. I'm not going to evaluate it just yet. Let's clean up. So we've got 3 fourths times 3 halves x minus. Whoop, cancel, cancel. That's a 2 now. So I've got 1 over 2 pi times sine 4 pi x plus, oh, nothing cancels here. Dang it. So 1 over 16 pi sine 8 pi x from 0 to 1 half. All right, plug in upper limit of a half. So this is 3 fourths times 3 halves times a half. That's 3 fourths minus 1 over 2 pi times sine of 4 pi times a half is sine of 2 pi. That's 0 plus 1 over 16 pi times sine of 8 pi times a half, that's sine of 4 pi, that's also 0. That's the upper limit. Minus, if I plug in 0, yeah, I'm going to get zeros for everybody. Everybody else is 0. So all we're left with is 3 fourths times 3 fourths. Are you a little sad? Don't be. We did a beautiful job. You should be proud. Okay, that's like the nastiest case I, I feel like would come up. So if you can handle that problem, you're ready. Um, what about powers of tangents and other trig functions? Think back to what derivatives and what antiderivatives you easily know. Do we know the antiderivative of tangent? Yes, we do. Antiderivative of tangent theta d theta is ln absolute value secant theta plus c. But I don't have tangent. I have tangent to the fourth. Do I know antiderivative of tan squared theta d theta? No, I don't know it. We use Pythagorean identity to fix that. Who's tangent's friend? Secant squared theta. Do I know that antiderivative? Yes, it's tangent theta. Okay, so that has to be clear in your head. Why? Because we're going to break up tangent to the fourth 2 theta into tangent squared 2 t, oh, it was a t, not a theta, excuse me, times tangent squared 2 t dt. And why am I doing that? Because one of these I'm going to replace with secant squared 2 t minus 1. And watch what's going to happen now. You're not going to leave it like this. You're going to distribute. And then now I have integral tan squared 2t secant squared 2t dt minus integral tan squared 2t dt. Okay, let's talk about these one at a time. This is going to be integral number one. This is going to be number two. So let's look at integral number one really quickly. Can you think of something to do? You're going to do a u sub. Secant squared 2t dt is the derivative, sort of, of tangent 2t. Not tangent squared, just plain old tangent. Okay, don't get wild. Let u equal tangent 2t, then du would be 2 secant squared 2t dt, right? Okay, so 1 half du is secant squared 2t dt, which is exactly what I have right here. And then I have tan squared 2t. Remember, u was just tan 2t to the first power. So this is u squared. This is du, but I need a 1 half, so I'll put it in the front. 
okay? Oh, we can integrate this, no big deal. One half times one third u cubed plus c1. So this is one sixth, what was u? It was tangent two t, so tangent cubed two t plus c1. There's that first little integral. Now what about the second one, tan squared two t dt? I just told you a second ago, we don't know the antiderivative of tan squared but we do know antiderivative of secant squared and we can get there very easily. Tan squared 2t is equal to secant squared 2t minus 1 dt and then you should be able to integrate this no big deal. This is going to be no u sub needed. This is just one half tan 2t not squared just tan 2t and then minus antiderivative of 1 is going to be t plus c2. All right, and then just remember we have subtraction between these two integrals, so I'm going to take integral number one minus what I have from integral number two. So we have one-sixth tan cubed 2t minus one-half tan 2t plus t plus c, where c is c1 minus c2, was it not? It was. Okay. It really does come down to you have to know your trig identities and your trig derivatives. So solid. So you could come up with a strategy. Otherwise, you will just stare at it for a half an hour and get nowhere. You know, writing down a bunch of gibberish like you're in a beautiful mind, part two. So just memorize the basics, the bread and butter, because that's how you are able to knock out these problems effortlessly. Okay, we've got another one, cotangent to the fourth 3t dt. It's going to be so similar, almost identical to the last one we did. I give you some limits of integration, pi over 12 to pi over 6, just to keep it spicy. Why don't you pause the video and try it on your own? And I'm not even joking when I say it's almost identical to the last one. Okay, did you pause it? I hope you did. So yeah, it's going to start off the same. I'm going to break it into cotangent squared times cotangent squared. So we've got pi over 12 to pi over 6 cotangent squared 3t times cotangent squared 3t dt. And then this cotangent squared I'm going to replace with cosecant squared 3t minus 1. And so we'll distribute now. And we have pi over 12 to pi over 6. This is going to distribute here and to here. Okay, so I'm going to just do it all in one shot. So cotangent squared 3t, cosecant squared 3t dt minus integral pi over 12 to pi over 6 cotangent squared 3t dt. Write your limits of integration every step of the way. Don't stop writing them just because you're lazy unless you want to lose points. Okay, Good. Um, let's just figure out how we're going to work with integral number one. So we have here, we're going to do a u sub, let u equal cotangent 3t. Then du is negative 3 cosecant squared 3t dt. Ooh. Okay. And then Let's see here, I'm going to change my limits of integration for this first one, okay? So u of pi over 12 is going to be cotangent of 3 times pi over 12, which is pi over 4. So cotangent of pi over 4 is just 1. And then u of pi over 6 is cotangent of 3 times pi over 6, so that's pi over 2, so that's cosine over sine at pi over 2, which is 0. So we're going to have a negative 1 third integral from 1 to 0, u squared du. And I would right away change this to positive, go 0 to 1, u squared du. Then we're going to Add 1, divide by the new exponent, so it's going to be 1 third u cubed. So I have 1 ninth u cubed from 0 to 1, which is just 1 ninth. Okay, great. Now let's work on integral number 2. 
here it is, pi over 12 to pi over 6 cotangent squared 3t. So we've got pi over 12 to pi over 6 cotangent squared 3t dt. So we don't know antiderivative of cotangent squared, but I do know antiderivative of cosecant squared. So I can replace that using my Pythagorean identities with cosecant squared 3t minus 1 dt. You guys, if you're rusty on your Pythagoreans, it's fine. Hopefully you know this, sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta equals 1, right? Even on a bad day, you can hopefully remember that. And then you're like, dang it. I need, what's the identity again with the cotangents and the cosecants? I can't remember. Well, I know cotangent theta is cosine theta divided by sine theta. So if I want to squeeze out the identity with cotangent squared, divide everybody by sine squared because cotangent has sine in the denominator. And then you go, hmm, what's this going to turn into? One plus, oh, that's cotangent squared equals cosecant squared. And that took me all of 10 seconds to do in the little margin of my paper. So you can do it, okay? If you're stuck on an exam, just remember the OG Pythagorean identity and then you're in business, okay? You can come up with what you need. All right, anyways, now you should be able to integrate. So what's the antiderivative of cosecant squared 3t? It's going to be negative one third cotangent 3t and then antiderivative of negative one would be negative t and this is from pi over 12 to pi over six then now let's evaluate very carefully so we've got negative one third times that's cotangent of pi over two right because i'm plugging in pi over six for my upper limit and that's zero minus pi over six minus lower limit, that's negative one third times cotangent of pi over four was one minus pi over 12. What is this? Minus pi over six plus a third plus pi over 12. All right, so then we're left with a negative pi over 12 plus one third, and that is the result from integral number two. So putting everything together, what did we have? Integral number one gave us one ninth, and we have one minus two. So one ninth minus this mess, okay? So we have now one minus two, which is one ninth minus negative pi over 12 plus a third, which is one ninth plus pi over 12 minus the third, which is minus 3 ninths, yes? So this is pi over 12 minus 2 over 9. Woo! Okay, I hope you liked that one. Anyways, that concludes part one. I need a break. We will do more. We still have trig sub, partial fractions, Simpsons rule, midpoint rule, trapezoidal rule, arc length, surface area, differential equations, and sequences and series, and polar, and con, oh my goodness. So <laughs> there's more parts to come. Give this video a thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't already. If you need more in-depth explanations, go to the Calculus 2 video lectures. Everything's in order. You can see breakdown, explaining the concepts, and more simple examples, laying the foundation should you need it. Also, you can catch me on Instagram and TikTok at Math TV with Professor V. Stay tuned, guys. I'll be back. Keep it up.